All right, thank you so much for joining us and um, thank you everybody for taking some time out of your evening or afternoon or morning. I think this is our seventh episode. Is that you were, you were saying, Amy? Um, so things have been going great and it's just been something that's been building and um, you know, please do spread the word and we're so in appreciation not only um, that Mary, you can join us and take some time out of your evening, but also, you know, folks can uh, just come and listen and, um, you know, support these voices. It's been really hard, you know, books are coming out and there's not a really good way to get the, you know, word out to people. So um, this, this has just been great. Um, and uh, I will turn it over to Amy to introduce Mary. Awesome. Um, so this is a real delight for me. Um, I think when I think about sort of getting started as a writer, honestly, uh, Mary's short story collection, Big World, which came out from Hobart's Press, Short Flight, Long Drive Books in 2009, um, was sort of like, I mean, Mary, you know this, but it was sort of like this cult book among those of us um, in Iowa City. And we were all reading it when I was there, um, just because it's a really fantastic, tight collection of short stories and I especially loved the depictions of the characters in the short stories um, and the way I think that like love was explored um, reminded me a lot of Lydia Davis, of Amy Hempel, just like really interesting tight writing. Um, and so that was a book that I read a lot in grad school and revisited again and again. Um, and then of course met Mary when she came to Iowa City to do some readings with Hobart. Um, it's just been a really just awesome to see her uh, continue to publish and do some pretty amazing things. Um, so she has two collections of short stories. The one, as I said, is Big World, which I absolutely love, um, and Always Happy Hour uh, as well. And then two novels, um, The Last Days of California, which is actually a kind of fitting <laughs> read, actually, now that I think about it, about sort of the end of the world um, in a different sort of way. And also, I, ho I hope I'm pronouncing this word right. I've been nervous all day, Biloxi, Biloxi um, which is also uh, out from Liver Right uh, uh, in 2019. Um, additional stories of hers have appeared in places as numerous as the Paris Review, the Oxford American, um, news stories from the South, Norton Siegel's Book of Stories, The Best of McSweeney's, uh, American Short Fiction, Mississippi Review, and others. Uh, she is also, uh, I think this is so fascinating, a former James Mishner Fellow in Fiction uh, at the University of Texas and a John and Renee Grisham Writer in Residence at Ole Miss. Um, and so she lives in Oxford, Mississippi, where she teaches and she writes uh, with her husband and her lovely dog. I think there's a dog theme going these last few weeks. Um, so it's my great honor uh, and our great honor to introduce Mary. Okay, um, thanks. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, um, so yeah, it's Biloxi. And I don't know why people can't say that word, but yeah, my agent has never been able to pronounce it. I'm just like, I, I'm like, Lux, L-U-X. Um, and then it's my, I guess I've had three books with Live Right, but I don't even know how to pronounce that. Is it Liver Right? <laughs> or is it You know, I said it, and then I looked at the spelling again, and I'm like, am I, it's one of those words that you read it, same like Biloxi, you yes. read it and, and you trust your way of reading it, but when you say it out loud, something feels a little funky. Yeah, I hope it's Live Right, that just sounds better. Um, okay, so like I said, I'm reading just a new story that I recently finished, and there is, there are a lot of curse words. There's also some references to suicide, um, so if you have to disappear, sorry about that, um, but please do so. Princess Leia. Outside the Hollywood Roosevelt, a girl dressed as Princess Leia asks us, asks us to sign a petition for Carrie Fisher's star. It seems wild that Carrie Fisher doesn't have a star, and I believe she deserves one, but I've made it a policy never to stop for anyone in the city, no matter what. The worst experience I ever had was when I accepted a CD from a guy on the streets of New York, and he cajoled and berated me out of $20. I still think about it, and it makes me feel ashamed. Carrie Fisher, troubled, was honest about her troubles, wrote a book about it, Star Wars, The Burbs, that's all I've got. The only re reason I remember she was in The Burbs is because I recently tried to rewatch it and it didn't hold up. 
Oh, hey, I imagine saying to the girl, sure, I'll sign. And she'd pass me the clipboard. Doesn't seem like a big deal at all. Maybe she'd want a donation too, though, and the encounter would end badly. Lately, I felt like an alien. I go to hug a friend and knock my head against his. In the middle of a conversation, I'll announce that I'm going to sit down. I think about asking my husband, do you ever forget how to be a person? And the look he would give me. He can talk to anybody, whereas I am very good at greetings, but then I have to keep moving. In the lobby, I stop to fix myself an afternoon coffee. My husband doesn't want one. He thinks one in the morning is enough. I wonder if there are other girls dressed as Princess Leia out there, I say to my husband. Perhaps there's a whole coterie of them. Oh, he says, somebody's pulling out their big words today. It's only, I pause to count, seven letters. It's not so big, medium at best. I take a sip of my coffee and realize that I don't want a second cup either, but will have to drink some of it in order to prove I wanted what I thought I wanted. Then I start to wonder if I used coterie correctly and pull out my phone to look it up. I will have to do it surreptitiously though, which is an actual big words word. How many letters is that? My husband is a know-it-all and we can get into arguments about the smallest things that can go on for a very long time. I try to think of a single man I have dated who wasn't a know-it-all and can't come up with anyone except for Kevin. I'm not sure what Kevin was, but he couldn't have been called a know-it-all, not exactly. He had firm ideas, but he wasn't the type to insist that his were the right ones, the ones to which I should also subscribe. I put my phone back in my purse. I promised myself that I would do my best to get along and let things go because this trip is costing a lot of money and vacation is hard enough. My husband and I do much better in remote areas where there is little to do. We take walks, we call hikes, look at the trees. We comment on the tallness and the bigness of the trees. I wait while he takes pictures of the sky and the waiting becomes its own activity. Start, stop, long breaks of nothingness as the vacation ticks by. In the city, however, he feels compelled to do as much as possible. He makes lists and when we run out of things on his list, he asks about mine, even though he knows I don't have one. I follow him down the hallway and out to the pool area, through a set of doors and down another hallway, which winds for a long time and then splits. There has got to be an easier way to get to our room, but he says this is it. I got lost trying to get ice yesterday, and to make myself feel, feel better about having gotten lost, I took a bunch of pictures of the pictures on the walls with my phone, old Hollywood stuff, girls in fancy dresses draped across beds and riding tigers, playboy bunnies, men in tuxedos, and sent them to a friend who likes this sort of thing. I told her she would love it here. Our hotel room, a cabana, isn't as nice as we thought it would be. It doesn't feel like a cabana, though there's a little outdoor patio with a table and two chairs, a tall hedge all the way around for privacy. I send my husband out there when I have to use the bathroom. We don't much like the area either, which is like Bourbon Street or Beale Street, the kind of places we avoid back home. But my husband took a friend's recommendation and made the reservation without doing any research, which is unusual for him. These are the things we don't like so far. People yelling in the streets and old women spinning sausages on little grills, wax museums, bars with the open doors blasting dance music, all of the tour buses and people wanting you to hop on their tour buses. There are so many tourists, and even though we are also tourists, it is hard not to resent them for making us feel so common. In the room, I settle into bed with a stack of magazines. We have three more days in LA, and the next time he asks for my list, I will give it to him. If he doesn't like my suggestions, at least he won't be able to say I didn't bring anything to the table. The trip began in San Francisco, where we rented a car and drove south along Highway 1, staying in different towns every night. I was the navigator, the one who looked out the window and said, ooh and ah, while telling him to keep his eyes on the road. It was the role I was born for. We saw three zebras on a hill outside of Hearst Castle. 
I thought a lot about those zebras imported from far away for rich people to watch as if they were birds. We saw dozens of elephant seals on the beach at Ragged Point, enormously ugly creatures lolling about, flipping sand onto their backs with their flippers, a video of which I sent to a friend that I messaged with on Twitter. This friend is a young filmmaker whose films are not very good. He sent me his most recent project, and I complained that it was too abstract, that I couldn't follow it. And he said that repetition, the effects of repetition, conveyed all the feeling. Or maybe he said that the colors expressed what words could not. When people try to explain why their art is bad, it is hard to be interested. And still, despite this, I have developed a terrible crush on him. Josh typically responds to my messages within an hour, but I've heard nothing for days and have begun to wonder if this video is the last thing I will ever send to him, our final correspondence, elephant seals on filthy sand with their high-pitched whines and burping noises, a couple of them rearing up to engage in a scrappy fight like preteen girls. In Los Angeles, I get sucked into an article titled Inside the Battle for Britney. There's a full page picture of Brittany from 2008 in which she had acne and dirty brown bangs, eyelashes clumpy with mascara. I hold it up to show my husband. There's a free Brittany movement going on, I tell him, hashtag free Brittany. Oh yeah? He doesn't care about Brittany, about pop stars. When we watch SNL, we never know who the musicians are. He goes to the bathroom. He doesn't ask me to go outside, which is nice of him, but it is also a burden. No one should be subjected to what people do in bathrooms in such a small space. He watches TV on his phone. There's a lot of gunshots and yelling, and I fluff my pillows and flip pages. What my husband does in the bathroom is no concern of mine, though he would be much better off with a deaf woman. Imagine how attractive my husband might be to a deaf woman. A blind woman as, as well could love him. His skin is soft. She would love his soft skin. There are mostly restaurant reviews in the magazine, profiles of chefs. We're cheap eaters, and though we could afford to eat in any of these restaurants, we'd be bitter about it afterward. There is no meal costing hundreds of dollars that might please us enough. I read about New Year's Eve festivities, all of the places we might go and the things we might do. If I haven't mentioned it yet, it is New Year's Eve. The hotel is having a party, and because we have a cabana room, we are to receive free entry, open bar, cocktail, party attire. I don't want to get dressed up, though, because I hate getting dressed up, and I don't want to wear the dress I brought because it shows the scar on my knee from a stupid fall I took on ice, half drunk in the dark. There has been some confusion over the wristbands, which were not given to us at check-in as they should have been, according to my husband. There has been a quite a bit of talk about these wristbands that I don't want and which we need so badly to obtain. The shower turns on. I go back to Brittany and the court-ordered conservatorship that governs her life. The article rehashes her breakdown, the head shaving, hiding in a locked bathroom with her kid and all the rest of it. Once you're deemed to fuck up, it is nearly impossible to convince people otherwise, or they're just waiting for you to fuck up again so they can say, see. Poor Brittany will never be given the chance to live down her initial fuck up because too many people have profited off it and continue to profit off of it. My husband comes out of the bathroom and drops his towel. He puts on his socks first and stands in front of the TV, which is playing something newsy. His penis, even when soft, is quite nice an object to admire. This is a good look for you, I say. You think? No, a naked body with socks is a tragedy. We should go to Hollywood Forever Cemetery tomorrow, he says. It's probably the only way I'll get to see some famous people. I tell him I like that Father John Misty song and play it on my phone. We saw Father John Misty in concert not too long ago. We're sure that whatever bands come through our small town are taking the night off though, half-assing it, and it mostly seems to be the case. I imagine them laughing in their hotel rooms after the show, talking about what fat, dumb hicks we are. Perhaps they even think about quitting music altogether. I sing along for a while, badly. I sing pretty well, but it's something I only do for myself. We haven't even seen the Hollywood sign yet, he says, zipping his pants. 
He looks at himself in the mirror and smiles, picks something out of his teeth. I thought we'd see it everywhere, he says. It's false advertising. I agree that it is false advertising. On our drive south, we'd listened to a podcast about the sign, learned that it was originally an advertisement for a real estate development, and that Hugh Hefner saved it twice, once paying nearly a million dollars to preserve the land. We learned that it is a very long and sweaty hike uphill to reach it, which I made clear that I was not going to do. I told you I'm not going up there, I remind him. So you said, I'm not kidding. I'll hike to Griffith Observatory, but that's it. How far is that? 20 minutes there and 20 minutes back, and that's enough. But anybody can do that, he says. My husband thinks he's different from other people, which makes me feel sorry for him. I know I'm a tourist, as common as a Midwesterner poking, poking through a wax museum right now, wondering if they should hop on a tour bus next or eat a street sausage. I scroll through Twitter, still no message from Buck Josh. Fuck him if he's going to go radio silent after the elephant seals fucking asshole. And read a thread from a guy who's lost two friends to suicide in the past month. He said there was no indication they were depressed, that there hadn't been anything to lead him to believe they would ever kill themselves. They seemed happy, normal, and this interests me, the no warning signs thing, because it is hard to believe it is true. Is it just something people say to make themselves feel better about having missed them? No one would ever say, we never saw it coming about me, and so I must go on living. A woman I know killed herself not too long ago as well, late November, just after Thanksgiving, her, names keep, her name keeps popping up in my head, Eliza, and there's the shock that she is no longer in this world. I won't see any new photographs of her dogs or her husband or her fancy meals or her vacations or her garden. Eliza never struck me as a tragic person, the kind who would die young or take her own life. She was pretty and smart and so well liked that it all seemed rather unfair, all that she had been given and the ease with which it had come to her. If a person like this feels like they can't live, where does that leave the rest of us? But I didn't know her well enough to say there were no warning signs. I think about how many people I know well, but at this point I couldn't even say I know my sister all that well. She lives in another town and I see her three or four times a year. I hardly know anyone besides my husband and he is as steady as always. I sent a letter to Eliza's brother, whom, I met, whom I'd met a few times, and wrote about my favorite memories with her in graduate school. There was the time we'd taken to the Texas, um, there was a time we'd taken to the Texas Hill Country on a spring day, just the two of us when the blue bonnets were in bloom, and another in which we'd camped with friends after hiking in Chanted Rock. It was a wonderful weekend, I wrote, and Eliza made an elaborate dinner using nothing but tinfoil pour over coffee and pancakes in the morning. She made everything special, I wrote, made everything light and fun. I mailed the letter and then felt like I didn't have the right to talk about her life or to claim any part in it. Despite this, I would want my sister to receive such a letter. I hope she'll receive many letters from people whose lives I didn't know I had affected. Out of the woodwork, that's where I'd like for them to come. You need to get dressed, my husband says. I hold the magazine in front of my face to block him. I'm gonna go check on these wristbands and when I come back, you should be dressed. I don't say anything. But once he's in the shower, I mean, but once he's gone, I get out of bed and get into the shower. I wash my hair and shave. My poor knee, I should never have taken that fall. There's the question of whether to put a bandage on it to pretend it is a fresh wound. A fresh wound is understandable in a way that a scar is not. I hear my husband come back into the room and put some rap music on while I brush my hair, slather hotel lotion onto my skin. It stinks like all hotel lotion. I do not want to go to this party. I think of Eliza, unable to go to a party ever again. I think of past New Year's Eves of note and they are uniformly terrible. There was one so long ago when I was in 11th grade and in love with a boy who sat across from me in choir. We commandeered a parent's bedroom and talked for what seemed like hours, kissed and said the sweetest things to each other, and then he ran to the bathroom and threw up in an act so violent I can still picture it in great detail. We never spoke again. 
Another New Year's, I was at the home of a college boyfriend. We watched the ball drop on TV with his mother and sister, both of whom disliked me. And then I slept in a room that had been shut up for years, the sheets musty, the bedspread an oversized doily, among the detritus of exercise equipment. I have never felt lonelier than I did in that room while my boyfriend slept in his childhood bedroom down the hall. My husband dances for me, raising his arms in the air and pumping them slowly, a dance so awful that you couldn't make fun of it, just like my singing. Perhaps he's an excellent dancer, but won't let me know for fear that I would make fun of him. It's unlikely, but I like the idea of it. Imagining him as a backup dancer for Brittany, so fast and on point under the bright hot lights. I put on mascara and blush my high heels. I put on another coat of mascara, an homage to Brittany. I cover my scar with makeup and it's hardly even noticeable. It's early and there's almost no one around except for the bartenders and waitresses working the party. We have our wristbands and our party hats and our nicest suitcase clothes. My husband gets us drinks and we sit and look at the pool, telling each other that it'll be good people watching. And we like people watching. Maybe there'll even be some famous people, I say. This is doubtful, but I say it because I know it will please him. He's saving up stories to tell his friends and coworkers. We did this and this, and we saw this and that. I never tell anyone anything about my trips. Everyone takes trips, they see things and do things, and they're hardly worth repeating. Let's go sit over there, my husband says. It's reserved. I don't see a sign. It is, one it is one of half a dozen spaces that are clearly reserved with special party favors on the cushioned benches, but he doesn't believe me and goes over there and sits. Immediately, a pretty girl asks him to leave. It is embarrassing and pointless as New Year's Eve is supposed to be. Someone will violently puke at the end of the night. You'll be trapped with someone else's poor relatives. Perhaps you'll drink a strawberry daiquiri after eating a plate of fried food and have a great urge to use the bathroom when you've just set out for a long walk. The new year will find a way to let you know that it will be just like the old one. The drinks are strong though, and my husband gets almost immediately shit-faced, which is unusual, but also fun, because he's a fun drunk. No, ha no, no matter how drunk I am, I'm not very fun, but we walk around and watch people, and he talks to some folks who don't seem terribly interested in us, but that's okay. And we take some pictures and then I tell him I'm hungry. At this point, he is pliable enough to be hungry too. We go out into the streets where there's a ch truck selling hot chicken. We buy a shit ton of hot chicken and take it back to our room and eat everything and then get into bed. I ask him whether we should go back out as the clock hasn't yet struck 12. There's no way I would leave this room, not for a good 14 to 16 hours, but I ask because I know he won't say yes and because it is the polite thing to do. Perhaps I could rally if he really wanted me to rally. I like the idea of it. This is something I might tell people. It was New Year's Eve and we were done for. Bellies full of vodka and hot chicken and there was nothing to rally for, but we did it anyway. I lie there thinking that it is not a bad news New Year's Eve. Nothing terrible happened, nothing terrible at all. Maybe I'll even agree to walk, to hike to the Hollywood sign. Not tomorrow, tomorrow my stomach will be iffy. But the day after that, I imagine how good I'll feel when it's over. My body both heavier and lighter and my husband will post pictures of us standing below the sign and people will like it and he'll feel good about himself. We all wanna feel good about ourselves. I'll comment, hands clapping, party hat, heart emoji. Um. So yeah, how, how depressing was that? Um, pretty, pretty dark. Thank y'all for listening. Um, thank you for reading, Mary. Yeah, thank y'all for coming. That was great, Mary. Thanks, guys. Um, I thought it was funny, we... too. <laughs> yeah, well, good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, me too. There were a lot of funny parts in there. I mean, ironic, I guess, but it was, uh, I liked it a lot. I didn't uh, think it was that depressing just real yeah good yeah new year's eves i mean why do they always suck maybe i'll have just like yeah <laughs> excellent new year's eves but man it's the worst night Mary, this is your brother i thought it was fantastic thanks brother 
Yeah, and it really was dark. I mean, you were a sad person. I know. <laughs> yeah. And you're, no, but that was that was great. I enjoyed yeah. it. Thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have time for uh, a couple questions. If anybody's got a question, you can unmute your mic if it's muted and ask a question. Or I think there's a chat box at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, oh, Amy, Amy, listen real real quick. You read uh, you read you read Mary's first book a couple times. Do you remember the story about the the uh, musician who was constipated? <laughs> that was me. No. Yeah. Yeah, the anal retentive musician. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Was, Can you just add much. it yourself? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nobody else would have recognized you. I'm like Mary. I have no shame. So it's, you know, we gave it up for Lent 20 years ago. See yeah, any questions? Um, fire away. You know, maybe we'll do like a five minutes. We try and kind of keep it to um, the half an hour. So you can either write in the chat or you know just chime in with a with a question. It looks like this chat. What do you have to click on it? Yeah. So it looks like we've got a question from Bob who said, um, "Does Mary outline for her novels at all?" That's a great question. Yeah, I um I don't outline for my novels, but um at least for the other two, but I, I may do more of it for this next one I'm working on just because it's, I don't know, it's kind yeah. of unwieldy and getting out of hand. But in the past, no, I haven't. I just feel like, I don't know, I wanted to, especially for a road trip novel, you know, I just wanted to follow them and see kind of what they got into. And it already had such confines around it because I knew they were working, you know, they had to, be somewhere like in three days or something um so it already kind of had the structure built in but yeah I'm not opposed to it but I generally don't work that way awesome it's a really good question from John Gibbs you frame a lot of your perspectives as dark I'm wondering what you use as a frame of reference um what, what do you mean like a lot of times like my short stories are just like you know, they start where, yeah, I, I don't know. I like to use different locations and stuff. And so I did recently go to California and I drove from um, San Francisco down to LA. And so most of it I didn't include in this. I have them in LA for the most part, but I don't know. I'm always looking to, to use different locations and settings and stuff, especially. So um, I do definitely take advantage of that, of course. Yeah, hard hard to do now. I'd I'd like go to a writers conference happily at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks like Kathy had asked specifically about the inspiration behind this story. Um, and you obviously you talked about sort of geographical. How do you come maybe to build on that? How do you come to, to a certain character or your narrator? Yeah, um, you know, I do have a husband and he is a quirky little fellow and doesn't mind if I fictionalize him in stories. So occasionally, you know, we will have like banter about just word usage and just the things that you, you know, go back and forth with, with your spouse or your partner, you know, just these nitty, you know, just real nitpicky things. And I'm like, oh, that's funny. You know, thinking about coterie and then surreptitiously, that's an actual big word. And so I'll, you know, I'll jot down little dialogue here and there, or if I overhear something or, um, you know, just looking out the window, I just try to be really observant and look for details that I can include. You know, in LA, I thought, yeah, I'm not used to seeing all of these women just with these tiny grills spinning hot dogs and they had their legs wide open and the little grill, you know, and I was like, that's, that's funny. That's, we don't have that in Oxford. <laughs> Write that down. So just always sort of like, yeah, being aware and taking notes. And I was also, yeah, on that strip around um, that hotel, um, there were all these wax museums. Like why are there three wax museums within a two block radius? That's really odd. Um, yeah, so I think it just comes down to looking for details that are different and that you can that you can use and paying attention to certain, you know, just people and the world and I don't know, specificity is what makes stories interesting. You know, you 
it's the only way really to like capture a situation in somebody's life. Um, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Mary, yeah. for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on Bunker Lit. Um, this is our, our seventh episode. Be sure to catch our eighth episode next week. Same time, same place, 8 p.m. Eastern, um, 7 p.m. Central. You can do the math from there. Um, but thank you so much, Mary. It was really wonderful to have you read. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you coming. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Everybody thank have a good night. Be safe. We miss you. Right. Bye, miss you. <laughs> miss you all too. Good night, guys. I don't know how to get out. Okay.